Hey, Black Blockchain Consultants. We have a special guest with us today. Welcome. My name is Sheree Warwick. I'm the founder of BBC. Uh, if you are part watching this on YouTube, we're really trying to increase our numbers on YouTube. So please hit the like button and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. At BBC, we focus on four things. Number one is if you want a blockchain-based job, especially if you are not a coder, then um, this is the place for you. Uh, we talk about the different types of blockchain jobs that are available, the different types of blockchain businesses you can start, um, investing in the blockchain, whether you want to invest your time or money into a blockchain project, and finally, how you can use this $3.1 trillion industry to build generational wealth for your family. I'm joined here by Blake Johnson. He's a self-taught developer who has been coding and teaching others to code for the past six years. Uh, he was one of the first employees of the Flatiron School and led his partnership with the Tech Talent Pipeline of New York City, creating a free version of the Flatiron School's flagship boot camp for underrepresented minorities in tech at a satellite campus in Brooklyn. So go Biggie Smalls. Um, he uh, bought his first Bitcoin in 2013 and he has been down the rabbit hole ever since. Ladies and gentlemen, we wanna welcome Mr. Blake Johnson to BBC. Welcome. Thank you, hey, everybody. <laughs> so um, we, even though I, I read your, your bio, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? You know, were you always into technology? Was it something that you fell into? Um, all the way to how you got uh, that first Bitcoin in 2013. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I have always considered myself a, a technologist. Uh, I sort of grew up during the, the Web 1.0 era. So when you know, I was in high school when eBay and all of those companies, Amazon, were getting started. And I was super excited about uh, the sort of tech boom. And I really wanted to be a part of it. Uh, but basically, right when I went to college, which was 2001, there was sort of the, the first tech crash. Um, so I'd wanted to be an engineer. I, I went to school to study engineering, uh, but didn't really enjoy it that much. Uh, so I ended up uh, switching to economics. Um, and then when I graduated, I just was sort of working in kind of like tech adjacent roles. Um, but I sort of hit a point when I was maybe about like 27, 28, uh, where I sort of had a, a moment where I said, like, I don't, I don't want to look back and not, uh, not have done everything I could to really be a part of the tech ecosystem in the way that I wanted to be. And part of that was I wanted to be able to um, experiment with some of my own business ideas, which were all sort of dependent on software and the web. And, and that was sort of during the time of sort of the rise of like Web 2.0. Um, and so I really wanted to be able to just hack on things, experiment, really like understand what was happening. Um, and so I ended up quitting my job and just deciding that I was going to sort of like lock myself in my room and just teach myself to program and do whatever I had to do to get there. Um, and that was around probably about 10 years ago. Um, and so that, that was sort of like the, the, my genesis of kind of my, my relationship to tech and finally becoming like a real programmer, as, as I sort of call it. Cool. Cool. So how did you buy your first Bitcoin? How did that happen? Um, that's actually a funny story. I have a, a good friend who's a, a great programmer, a very smart guy. Um, he got into Bitcoin kind of in one of the previous bubbles. I, I don't know if everyone here was remembers this, but uh in 2013 bitcoin went from about 100 200 to about 1200 in, in like a month or two and he bought some maybe at like 20 uh, sorry 200 sold it almost at the top at like 11 1200 and i remember him just telling everybody what a genius he was and you know how much money he made and so on and so forth and so i, I was frustrated by that and a little you know a little jealous and so i started reading about it um, and I read the Bitcoin white paper and I sort of was immediately fascinated and, um, and then started, started buying Bitcoin just really because I wanted to be a part of what I thought was one of the more interesting kind of paradigm shifts in, in history. And mm -hmm. the, the, I, I certainly wasn't buying it with the idea that it was going to uh, appreciate in, uh, in value in the way that it has. Um, it, has it, was just, yeah. it was really just... I thought the white paper was so fascinating and I was just like, I have to be a part of this in some way, shape or form. 
Yeah. Well, around the same time, I would say I, I learned about Bitcoin and I was like, I'm not quite sure what this thing is. Um, so it was interesting because I didn't do what you did. I probably should have just bought one just, you know, for the hell of it. Sure. Um, but I didn't. I was kind of like, yeah, I'm not quite sure what this is. And I don't tend to get into things that um, that I'm not sure about. But sure. Uh, what really got me into it was I used to watch CNBC all the time. And, you know, there was about two month period where all they talked about was Bitcoin, 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 the price of crypto, what was happening. And that was what kind of got me to stop and say, okay, I better figure out what this thing is because of the type of business that I had at the time, or or else I'm really going to get left behind. And I think that a lot of people, you know, were introduced to it when it really started to peep into mainstream yeah. and um, we saw our anchors you know, on TV saying, hey, this thing is happening over here, you know, um, it sure. was still only 1% to 2% of people are even involved with the technology. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what happened after that then? You bought, you bought your Bitcoin and, and then what? What was the next thing uh, that happened in your journey? Uh, so at the time I was, I was teaching uh, and I, I just sort of continued to learn as much as I could about Bitcoin. I, I shared uh, what I was learning with a bunch of my students, tried to get them excited about it. I'm, I'm sort of a believer that uh, whether whether you see Bitcoin as like a great investment or a place that you should um, put your money, I I never tell people how to invest their money, but I just sort of say like, here's sort of what I'm doing and here's how I think about it. And um, my, my belief is that um, this will be one of the most, if not the most important sort of paradigm shifts in human history. Um, And so what I tell people is like, buy a dollar worth of Bitcoin, buy five dollars worth of Bitcoin because the, the, the true, um, uh, the, the benefit, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be financial. It's like you go, you, you buy some, you know, you, you understand, okay, where do I store it? Do I store it on an exchange? Like, and I, for me, like when it really clicked was, you know, when I, when I sent some Bitcoin to someone and it was just like, you, you sort of have this theoretical understanding of how it works and then you actually do it. And um, you realize that you just sent somebody money and there was no banks involved. And there's just a network of computers that confirmed that transaction, all these people that don't know each other. Um, and that was like a really magical experience for me. And, and my, my hope is that, you know, if somebody buys $5 worth of Bitcoin, it's unlikely that that amount of money is going to affect their life positively or negatively, right? If it disappears tomorrow, like you'll, you'll be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but by having it, usually that's a forcing function to be more interested in it and learn more about it. And once you have some, uh, you, you know, you want to understand it, you, you know, you're, you're forced to try and like, um, you know, send it to people, maybe it was a little confusing and, and you know, and so you want to learn more about it. Um, so for me, just like continuing to use it, continuing to learn about it, continuing to teach my students. And then as I was teaching my students, that was great feedback in terms of like, okay, like what didn't make sense to them? Uh, where, where do I need to go to like understand it on a deeper level to make sure that I can explain it to them better? Um, and so that, that was sort of like a nice, uh, a nice process. And then around that time, that was, um, Bitcoin, from a lot of people's perspective, uh, right around then, like the network was getting really congested. And so people were saying Bitcoin doesn't scale. And that was sort of the first big conversation around the problems with Bitcoin. And that was kind of when the Ethereum conversation started to happen. And so I got pretty excited about Ethereum. I got some Ethereum. Uh, I started going to um, uh, a, a guy started running a meetup. Um, somewhere in Brooklyn um, to just get people together and like talk about Ethereum and help each other sort of learn to program on top of Ethereum. And so I started playing a bunch with Ethereum and I, and I got pretty uh, disillusioned with Bitcoin just because it felt like um, from a technical perspective, the development had totally slowed down and it had stopped and there was all this sort of animosity in the Bitcoin community and people couldn't, uh, people couldn't come to consensus around like what, what the best path forward was. And it felt a little bit to me like that was Bitcoin was dying from a emotional, social perspective. And so I really invested a lot of time and energy into Ethereum and trying to understand that and trying to understand what are the positives and negatives of Ethereum versus Bitcoin and that sort of thing. And so um, that, that was sort of like the next, the next phase of, of my evolution. Okay. So, um, 
when you were, you know, getting, uh, you know, when you were learning about Ethereum, were you also learning about other uh, cryptocurrencies, other projects? Were you, you know, moving towards the blockchain uh, technology side of it, or were you just on the crypto side? Like, you know, what was happening then? Uh, to be honest, like back then, I didn't think there was any other projects that were worthwhile. Um, you know, that, that was sort of like um, when the term altcoin started, you know, coming around and there was tons and tons of other projects other than Ethereum. Uh, to me, they all felt um, very scammy uh, and just not, not attracting serious people. Um, and I really liked the community that Ethereum was building and um, it was like a a lot of people that wanted to help each other out, like a lot of people that really wanted to uh, invest uh, their time and energy into, into building that. And, and yeah, that, that was also, you know, a time where I was trying to understand like, okay, what's the difference between cryptocurrency and like the underlying technology and like how do blockchains work? And I was looking at like um, potentially doing some mining and I did some mining and uh, yeah, really trying to go as deep on a technical perspective as I could to sort of understand Ethereum. Uh, but I, I did get a little frustrated because back then and still today, Ethereum was very hard to use. It was very hard to develop on. Um, so, you know, even trying to do the most basic development that I was trying to do to just sort of play around and understand it was, was pretty frustrating. Um, so, you know, kind of had Bitcoin and Ethereum. Now we're going to start getting upgrades. Uh, they're saying sometime this year. The yeah, I mean, the 2.0 is coming out and they're saying that Bitcoin uh, is going to have some upgrades as well. So, uh, I mean, there's there seems to be an evolution. It's kind of like us being in the early 90s with the Internet, you know, um, sure. where uh, you, 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 you know, fix one problem and discover three more. And it's this path to mass adoption. It's one of the big things that we've been talking about as our community. Yep. is what's the path to mass adoption and then how can we be in position where we as black people are not the last to know about it and aren't the biggest consumers but we don't own any of it like that's sure. my passion is to figure out how we can own a piece of this and not just be the consumers of it sure yeah absolutely yeah. um and and so what what does that look like for you in terms of uh getting black people to be owners of this is that from like a do you advocate like investment or or how do you think about it well one of the first things when i when i when we first got started we of course were on the bitcoin you know crypto train and um i write business plans for a living so mm -hmm. i understood innately the difference between owning crypto and owning a piece piece of the platform Yep. So one of the first things that I came out with, just letting people know, educating people, just because you own the crypto doesn't mean that you own a piece of the platform. One of the things that I believe is going to happen, and I started predicting this, it hasn't happened yet, but we're starting to see this trend, is that Fortune 500 companies, they get bigger by acquiring companies and acquiring new technology. They don't typically create their own, right? Sure. I believe that there will be blockchain platforms that will be built that will serve certain problems. And those platforms will be purchased by these Fortune 500 companies. Why do I believe that? Because VCs are funding these platforms. It was at the time, 2018, where VCs were really funding the platforms because they took out, the SEC got involved and said, you can't do these ICOs anymore. Remember all yeah. that? Okay, so the way VCs get their money back is by either a company doing an IPO or getting acquired. What I was suggesting to black people was, don't just buy the crypto, figure out how you can get involved with the founders of a project, a blockchain project that you have, think have true potential and join their team and ask for equity in the business, in the corporation. So that's why one of our tenants is investing in blockchain projects, whether you're investing time or money into a project, okay? And using that to build generational wealth. So right. that was one of the ways. The other way is 
Um, we have people within BBC that are in certain industries, healthcare, education, cybersecurity, et cetera. They know some of the problems within those industries that blockchain can help solve. So we have people teaming up now in order to create their own platforms and in order to solve certain problems within the industry. And guess what? Those are black owned companies that, um, that you know, can, can participate in blockchain. Um, yep. And then the third thing that we have been talking about for a while is how do we fund our own companies? You know, we as black people have, uh, a harder time getting funding from VCs or anybody uh, than um, the average person that's out there. And again, I've sure. been in the business plan writing game where I see people raise millions of dollars. I can tell you, it's who you know. It really is. So, and we just don't have access to those rooms. So, we have been looking at um, smart contracts and tokenization and. You know, some of us are, are asking, how can we figure out a way where we can fund our own projects? And it started out just being our own blockchain projects, but now we're talking about funding innovation, you know, overall. Um, I just read, uh, I'm sorry if I'm blabbing, but you can let me no, know. No, not at all. Uh, um, I read Andrew Yang's book over the past week where he's talking about um, how automation is going to kill a lot of, it's already killed a lot of manufacturing jobs, it's killing a lot of retail jobs, uh, truck drivers are on the chopping block, a lot, you know, even food services, food prep is going to be overtaken by AI and robotics, and our sure. people are not going to be prepared for it. So um, what are the things that we can do in order to mitigate that and help people transition to jobs, you know, the jobs of the future. Um, sure. So, you know, that, that was a long answer, but, but there's, you know, I think that there are a lot of things that we can do uh, to, to be owners within the industry and not yep. just laggards and consumers of it. And we've seen these um, reports where black wealth is supposed to be zero by 2050. Yep. What can I do? What can you do, Blake? What can we do within BBC to help stop that? You know, um, sure. and it's got to start with their own families and then bleed over into the community at large. So. Yeah, absolutely. On, 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 on that front, I mean, the way that I have sort of approached that is always education. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that a lot of uh, friends and, and people I interact with say is like they'll sort of sort themselves into one of two categories. They'll they'll, they'll either say, "Yeah, I'm a technologist. I'm a you know I'm a computer person, or I'm not a computer person." And I think there was a time where that was fine, right? 80s, 90s, whatever. You could say, "I'm not a computer person," and you'd be fine, right? Uh, to your point, like Andrew Yang's book, right? Everyone in the future will either be a computer person or they'll be unemployed, right? True. So you don't get to opt out anymore and it can, it, you know, computers and the internet and blockchain and all that stuff. Um, it, it can be scary. Uh, you know, it can, uh, I think people in the industry like to use as much jargon as possible because it makes them seem like they have some magical knowledge that's too, you know, too complex for the average person to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the reality is generally that's nonsense, right? It is, you know, just like any other industry, there, there's some things that you need to learn, but the, the, there's nothing magical about it. Um, so I, I'm always trying to like educate people and first of all, just educate them on the fact that they can't opt out uh, and so that they might as well start today. And, you know, it's going to be just as scary today as it, it is going to be tomorrow, but it's just going to take some time and it's going to take some commitment. Uh, so I, I run a, a, a co-working space um, and we've had, uh, since 2017, we, we have a, a free meetup that anyone can come to. And every week we read a white paper of, of what me and some of the other folks think are like foundational um, ideas in blockchain. And we read it and then we get together and then we discuss it and we try and figure out like what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what didn't we understand from a technical perspective and try and um, help each other. And that's totally free. You know, anyone at any skill level can come in and, uh, you know, try and get themselves um, sort of up to speed. 
And how do um, and so, how do people uh, get on the mailing list for that? So the 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 co-working space is called Crypto NYC. Uh, we're in Bryant Park in, in Midtown New York. Okay. Uh, so obviously it's somewhat limited geographically. Uh, but if you go to meetup.com and you look up Crypto NYC, uh, we post all our meetups uh, on there, and anyone is welcome to to come in. Uh, we do it every Wednesday at at noon, and we've been doing doing it for over two years now. Okay. You, uh, um, you would do great having that virtual as well, because there would be people all over the globe who would want to uh, participate in that. So yeah, I just would put that plug in. <laughs> I I I I like um, I like the idea of doing stuff virtually. In theory, I have found in practice um, it doesn't work well. At least for me, I. I just personally really like engaging with people like face to face, which is why we started the co-working space. A lot, a lot of the crypto space does exist virtually, which is great because it allows people access. Um, my, my frustration is that I think a lot of times the technology in terms of video conferencing, that sort of stuff is it, it often can still be uh, a little bit limiting. Um, and so it's, it's hard to hear each other. It's, you know, it's hard to uh, really kind of slow down and, and dig into stuff. So I have in general chosen to, um, try and do smaller groups of people and, and make sure that when we do get together, we actually um, are able to understand, understand each other and, and, and get some real, um, get some real uh, understanding. Um, but I, I totally agree with you. Um, in, in theory, uh, opening up it up virtually uh, would, would definitely like allow us to, to reach more people. So I have a follow-up question for you with regards sure. to the white papers. Are there any that you've read that you think are like the top four or five that, I mean, Bitcoin, obviously, because that was the original. Um, sure. But any others that you've read that you're like, you know, that's a really good white paper. I think that we either as Black people or just entrepreneurs or, you know, in the industry should take a look at. Um, it's a good question. I've actually read so many that, that I love. Um, and I think one of the difficulties is that they really exist on so many different, uh, levels of, um, complexity. So kind of depends on who, who the audience is, but, uh, I'm happy after this to, um, to take a minute and, and, um, come up with a list of ones that I think are, are good and kind of segment them by, uh, by, um, technical audience. But w one of the things that I love about the Bitcoin white paper um, is I think most white papers that came after the Bitcoin white paper, um, people wanted to make them sound more complex than they were so that they could raise money and get people excited. Um, and, and what I loved about the Bitcoin white paper is it's, I don't know, 10, 10 pages, Simplicity. something like that. It's yeah. so clear, concise, simple. He doesn't try and make it complicated he, you know the whole point is the simplicity and that's that's what i think is so beautiful is that he, even if you read it in a lot of the specific technical terms you don't understand the high level ideas are are, are very simple and anybody can understand them um and I, and I think that that's like what's beautiful about that paper yeah yeah so i want to go back to something else that you said i was writing some notes as you were talking you talked about sure. education and and how important it is to educate people i also want to add on that is we need access as well so we can be educated however for us to move the ball forward as a people i do think we need access to the right people which means you may have to you know, go to a blockchain conference or join a blockchain working group. Um, on on uh, Friday, there's another member of BBC and I that are going to Capitol Hill to talk with some of the lawmakers uh, you know, about uh, what's happening in the blockchain industry in terms of governance. Um, yep. We have other people in our group that are going to the SEC, you know, working with this uh, group with regards to tokenization and crowdfunding and some of the laws that are there. So, um, you know, I really do encourage our people not just to educate ourselves, but to be in proximity, because when you're in proximity to decision makers, I'm not just talking lawmakers, I'm talking CEOs, people who can pull you into projects. The number one reason I get so many offers is because I know so many people and they're like, Cherie, we like her. We know, we don't even know if she's going to be good at this specific job or we're going to call her and ask her anyway, because sure. she'll figure it out, you know, Absolutely. but that comes from not just educating yourself, but being, you know, 
being available, being out there. And, and yeah. that's one of the other things that I try to encourage people to do. Not everybody is in our group is necessarily able to do it physically. I live um, between DC and New York. Um, so it's easier for me. However, yeah. I, that's why I also suggest a virtual space because we've had a lot of people that are able to get opportunities just because of virtual communities that we've set yeah. up. I think that's one of the things that's also great about the crypto blockchain ecosystem is that mm -hmm. um, in general, it's still so new. None of us know what we're doing. So even the people that are experts are just very open to um, helping other people kind of become involved. And, you know, for example, the Ethereum folks, like by definition, the Ethereum project is open source, right? So everything is is available to anybody. They do their, uh, their um, weekly calls you know anyone can hop in and listen there's so many different um projects where the communities are just completely open and, and anyone like virtually from anywhere in the world can just become a part of that just by hopping on a call and just starting to be a person that you know they recognize your face or, oh you you know you've you've been here for the last six weeks and, and i think um consistency is is really really important you know we we've been as i said like we've been doing the same meetup you know, once a week for over two years, right? And we've gone through the whole hype cycles of price and crazy amounts of people wanting to come and less people coming. But, you know, over a couple of years, we've built a community of people that want to support each other. And to your point, right, you know, now we've gone, we've gone to Ethereum conferences around the world together. We, you know, we know lots of people and we have a great um, network that we've built, you know, be, by being consistent, right? And so people know us and they want to support us and they, um, you know, and invite us, uh, you know, to be parts of things. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what are you working on now? Like, what are some of the projects that you're working on now that you want to tell us about? Uh, so the, the main, I only do two main things. Uh, I, I've been trading and investing in crypto for about seven years now. So that's, that's the main thing that I do. Um, I'm sort of a software developer by trade, and so from time to time, I, I uh, will, will help a uh, project here and there. But for the most part, it's just doing the trading thing, and then uh, crypto and my C also like you know run, running that and uh, you know trying to support the, the community. Fantastic, fantastic. So um, uh, one of the things that you also mentioned is that you're gonna you know either be a person that's into computers or you're gonna be unemployed. And yep. I wanted to address that because um, I agreed with it, but I want to add something to it as well. Sure. So there are certain industries that will always need people. For example, if you're a nurse, you know, if I could go back in time and I wasn't scared of blood, I'd be a nurse or something like that, that would really yep. have longevity. Um, yep. But again, in Andrew Yang's book, he was talking about that even some doctors are going to be obsolete in the next 50 years, you know? Yep. And I was like, wow, it's like general practitioners and dermatologists and it's like, really? You know, yeah. but they're creating all of this, this um, new technology around that. Um, but, I, but, you know, healthcare is something that's going to still be around coding, the coders themselves, the business analysts, the people that are behind the scenes. And I think one of the big things that we can let people know is that the people who are able to problem solve Mm -hmm. So it's not just people who are in, into computers, but people that are able to problem solve um, are going to be the ones who are going to make it, you know, versus if all you're able to do is remember the I Love Lucy episode where she she's, you know, um, uh, making the chocolate and all she's doing is, you know, uh, pulling the lever down. If that's all you can do and you can't. Um, you can't answer or ask complex questions, answer them, you know, figure things out, then you're really going to be left behind. So I think one of the biggest things we can teach our kids, and this goes back to your, your coding um, lessons as well, is how to ask and answer, you know, those tough questions. And how do we teach our kids to be in that mindset as well in order to train for jobs that they don't even know exist today, sure. you know, be able to do that. 
Yeah, I think to your point uh, earlier, you were talking about, you know, not just being consumers of technology. You know, that's that's one of the things that I find the most frustrating about the technology industry's products is that the great part about it, you know, Apple is you use the iPhone and you don't have to know anything, right? It's mm -hmm. so simple. You know, a two-year could use it. iPad, same thing, right? Like you now have like a full computer where you don't need to know anything about how it works. Um, whereas a traditional, if you, you know, use a MacBook Pro, uh, you know, you, you, you really can kind of interact with the operating system and be more like a producer. Um, and so I think it's, it's great that like technology products are getting easier for the average person to use. Um, the bad part about that is they're hiding more and more of sort of the guts of, of what's happening. And so if you used to grow up using computers, you'd, you just by definition would have to learn a lot about how, how they work um, to, to actually be able to just do basic things. And now so much of that is hidden. Um, and so I think it's important to understand that, that distinction um, as you're sort of getting involved in technology. Like, as I was saying, I, I don't necessarily mean when I say it's only people that are into computers. I don't only mean people that are programmers. Mm -hmm. I just mean that like technology, good technology helps people do their jobs better. Right. And it augments our ability to be really effective. And so, you know, even if you're a nurse and you're in healthcare, right, you're using incredibly expensive, complex technology mm -hmm. to deliver healthcare. And so the ability to like get in there and say, okay, like what's coming next, right? How might I, might I, even as a nurse, see what's coming and understand um, how to evolve my ability to work with technology to be a better and better nurse um, and, and that sort of thing. And to your point, again, about doctors, right? Like uh, radiologists are going to go away because- Yes, I read that. Yeah. So software is getting better at detecting cancer than, uh, you know, or, or similar things, right? Than, uh, mm -hmm. than a doctor. But- the best doctors will still be people who work with that software to deliver better recommendations than just software or just a doctor. Um, so I think like understanding that it's people that work with the technology that are gonna be the most effective, um, not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to be the person creating the technology. Right, right. So I think it's technology plus problem solving plus humanity. Yeah, Where, absolutely. You know, because because you'll always need human touch. Um, yep. You know, the, the robots, they're going to be doing a lot, but there are just certain things where you need, for example, you know, a man's touch, a woman's touch, children, you know. Sure. Um, so, so yeah. Um, well, we want to, uh, again, thank Blake for, for coming on. If you uh, want to be a member of Black Blockchain Consultants, we are at blackblockchainconsultants.com. You can click on the membership button there. We're going to have a lot of inner circle uh, conversations this year with regards to jobs and and businesses that you can start. And, and within the inner circle, we talk about how to do things and not just what's available. But Blake, uh, before we go, is there you know anything else you wanna tell the family with regards to what you're doing, how people can find you, uh, anything like that? Uh, I would say I would, I would love to see anybody at uh, Crypto NYC. And again, I would recommend uh, if you don't own $5 worth of Bitcoin, stop what you're doing right now. Sign up for Coinbase, buy $5 worth of Bitcoin and send some Bitcoin to somebody. Um, and, and use that. Yeah, preferably extra. me. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, that's all I was going to say. Okay. Well, I will also say that uh, within BBC, starting on, I think it's February 12th. Uh, yeah. Starting February 12th, we're going to be giving away $25 worth of Bitcoin every week for a four week period. Oh, uh, cool. We're going to be uh, raffling that off and more information to come on blockchain chat this coming Wednesday. So, you know, stay tuned for that. But definitely open up your Coinbase account if you have not done so, because you may be the winner of $25 worth of Bitcoin. And then the question is, do you save it or do you spend it? <laughs> so my vote is for saving, but hey. Um, anything else, Blake, that we should know? Uh, no, I think that's it. Okay, then. Well, thank you so much, everybody who has joined us today for this great interview with Blake Johnson. Please uh, go to Meetup and go to Crypto NYC. Um, he's also going to, I'm going to uh, tag him on this to add to uh, tell us the top white papers 
that he thinks we should read, and we may do that as an inner circle project as well, uh, as well this year in 2020. So thank you, Blake, for joining us. And if there's anything BBC can do for you, please let us know. Will do. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.